Okay, everyone, so it is 101. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. A few more people might start to trickle in, but um, I think we can get things started. Uh, so my name is Drew Malmuth. I'm the community manager here at the National Guild for Community Arts Education, uh, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, James C. Horton. Hey, everybody. How are you today? And uh, Mac Adam Smith. Hello. Uh, so we're really excited to have everyone here today. Uh, so this is the Get to Know the Guild video chat, and this is really just an opportunity for uh, staff at the Guild to give a presentation about what, what we do, what we're all about, um, and for you all to learn about how the National Guild might be able to support your work in arts education. Uh, so we're thrilled to have you all here. Uh, we're going to do a presentation from Guild staff to give you an overview of our work, but then we're going to really open things up for questions and um, you can really ask more specific questions about how being a member of the Guild might uh, really elevate the work of your organization and, and help you reach more students and uh, improve your communities through arts education. Uh, so just to kick things off, a few housekeeping um, issues and just some tech logistics. So uh, for those who haven't used Zoom before, um, I'm gonna just going to walk you through some of the functionality. Uh, on the bottom left, you'll see there's the ability to mute and unmute yourselves. Uh, and we just ask that if you're not speaking, uh, to please mute yourself um, as this uh, just uh, makes the sound a little bit better and we don't have as much uh, feedback. You can also start and stop your video um, and we, I see that some people have their videos off which is fine but if you want to show your beautiful faces you can also start your video um, and that's a real advantage of Zoom is that you know you can really see everyone and uh, feels a little more intimate. Um, the other button that might be useful is the chat. So uh, you can toggle the chat button and that'll allow you to either send a message to everyone, uh, ask a question, um, an observation, um, ask questions to other people in the group, see if they're struggling with similar things, um, or you can send a private message just to Guild staff or to others that are, that are part of the chat. Um, Let's see, you can also right click on your name uh, in, in your little video tile. You can see that there's a name that's there. You can right click on that to rename yourself if you'd like everyone to know uh, your full name and your organization. Uh, you can also, and this is the last thing, you can also toggle the view. So in the top right hand corner, you'll see that it'll either say speaker view or gallery view. And you can click on that and that'll change uh, what you're looking at. It'll either be the person who's speaking or it'll be this kind of Brady Bunch style thing that some of you may be seeing right now. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm going to kick it over uh, to Mac, Adam, and James, who are going to start us off with a brief presentation. Thanks for being here, everyone. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. And while Drew said this is a presentation, I like to think of it as a conversation. So if at any time you have questions or sort of want to talk about some of the things that I'll go over, just a brief overview of Guild, the National Guild and its programming, uh, please stop me and uh, I'm happy to jump into a dialogue with you. So before we get started, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about our history. We were founded in 1937 as the National Guild for Community Schools of the Arts. And in 2010, we had a name change in which we turned into the National Guild for Community Arts Education. And through that name change, we really were able to sort of open that umbrella up in all organizations throughout the country who saw themselves doing community arts education, were able to sort of find a pathway into this work that we're doing as the National Guild. So that was really critical to our growth and moving forward and getting us to this point uh, right now. I'm also happy to say that we are celebrating 80 years young, um, which is really monumental for us as well, because through that time, um, and especially in this 80th year, we've been able to sort of refocus and repurpose ourselves, if you will, in thinking about a new vision and mission and really identifying some core values for the National Guild as an organization and how we plan to work with our members and the rest of the field moving forward. Um, three key components to our programming, developing leaders, strengthening organizations, and of course, advocating for community arts education. Next slide, please, sir. Um, key objectives to our work. So we like to think of this as in two big buckets. Uh, one is to build the capacity of everyone that we're working with, our core members, of course, but also the field in general. And so we do that through a host of different uh, vehicles, uh, be it professional development, Zoom chats uh, that you see right here, webinars, um, some in-person convenings, and we'll dig more into those uh, as we go throughout the webinar. Uh, we also like to work to create greater financial support for you as the person who's on the ground providing direct service to the community that you serve. And then in hopes that we really can, can see some systemic change here. 
uh, in the programming that we're doing and the work that we're doing with you. And we also like to think of this um, to increase the support and investment in community arts education. So that goes back into that advocacy component of the programming that we offer throughout the year, being able to give you the language and the tools to go to your local and state um, arts agencies and really put forth the case to support what you're doing in your community. Uh, guild members, we are about 435 strong right now. Uh, and those members are a little bit of everybody who's doing community arts education. We have uh, community centers, we have art centers, um, music schools, um, multidisciplinary uh, divisions of colleges and universities, <clears throat> excuse me. But um, the 501c3 organizations, the majority of them, we have some educational affili affiliates, um, but government agencies, but our main purpose and focus uh, is to provide high quality um, arts education experiences to those who are working with us. And then the organizations that we serve in turn are those as well. They partner with public schools, senior centers, um, social service agencies, a little bit of everybody to make sure that they are promoting this lifelong love of learning and participation in the arts. Uh, like I said, uh, 350 plus multidisciplinary members, uh, community schools, arts and cultural centers, youth centers and orchestras, and divisions of performing arts companies, universities, colleges, museums, government agencies, and other organizations. And that other organizations, I want to pull that out for a second. Um, like I said in the beginning, in 2010, we really changed our name so that all these other organizations were able to see themselves uh, in this work and be a part of this mission and this movement that the National Guild has become come today. Uh, we are a learning community. So as we go on, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about our programs. But the Guild is not us. It's not the office or the headquarters here in New York City. The National Guild is you. Uh, and in keeping, uh, keeping in line with that, we like to think of ourselves as learning from you, putting you in a position to teach others throughout the country, and really leaning on the best and most effective practices when programming and thinking about programs that can move their individual communities forward. Uh, we always love to share the resources and strategies uh, that you've already come up with in your programs. No use in reinventing the wheel when somebody has made one that works very well. So Drew will talk um, at length about our resources Center later on in, in which you can really see how to take advantage of this learning community. Key initiatives. Um, and this is great because this is really aligned with our Conference for Community Arts Education annual conference this year will be in San Francisco. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. But we really like to think of this as working in arts and education. So any programs uh, that you have that go into schools and provide services. Of course, community partnerships. Uh, what would this work be without working with those community partners? Uh, creative aging, again, looking at a lifelong um, love and learning in the arts creative youth development, which really looks at how we work to develop young people through putting the arts at the central front of that. Leadership development, of course, and then teaching artist development, when we know that so many of those folks on the front lines are our TAs who are doing the work in the classrooms. James, can I just add that sure. uh, on top of this, it's not specifically one of our key initiatives, which are more programmatic, but uh, definitely nonprofit management and growing your organization is very much tied into all of these initiatives as well, and making sure that we're strengthening the organizations of our members in the field. Absolutely, thank you, McAdam. And then some of our strategic partnerships, uh, we work with partners all around the country, some of them being our member institutions, and then a lot of them being um, government agencies and other service providers who are focused on the arts. So we have Americans for the Arts, GIA grant makers in the arts, the NEA, um, the President's Committee for Arts and Humanities and the Wallace Foundation, just to name a few. Uh, we have several initiatives that are sort of in play right now uh, with these national partners. So gentlemen, Thanks, James. Thank so I think you. now we're going to bring it over and uh, dive a little deeper into our website, which should give you all a great overview of um, some of the programming that we provide and uh, some of the functionality of our, of our online space. Yeah, so this is just to start us off. This is our web page. Um, enjoy and admire it now because it will be gone by the end of the year. We're working on a new one. But just to give you guys uh, a, an intro to our kind of online presence. This is our landing page. As you can see, we've got our 
uh, we've recently updated our uh, vision, mission, and values, which you probably have uh, heard about. We've been discussing that in emails and online a bit, so you might have heard about that as well. But you can see that's kind of our banner, our banner lead news item right now, um, our benchmarking report, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But this is our website. Uh, I was going to start first with uh, the member directory, which is uh, a tool that we put together where we, where our members uh, and the public at large actually can use to search through to see who the members of the guild are, what their disciplines, uh, what kind of um, art they art education they offer. Uh, our members using the site have a more in-depth search uh, options, filters, and information that's provided in here. Kind of the general public just gets a, a, a basic glance at who our members are. Um, but just to give you uh, a preview of it. Uh, to search through, you can search by keyword to kind of search for specific, um, to search for disciplines. You can search for organizations by name if you know specific names. We can also search by budget range. If, you're, if you are a member, this is a feature that we have. You can search by budget range and by discipline. So for example, if we wanted to look at music organizations within this kind of budget range, we could search and see what comes up. These are our members that fit into that category. And if you then click on one of our members, you get some information on a member, where they are. Our, if you're logged in as a member, you get contact info of the primary staff contact. You can see Susan Keegan here, the executive director of Artwell. Uh, and this is a chance for our members to get to network with each other, to. Uh, we see it as a chance for members to really be able to say, you know, I am an organization, these are my categories. I'm looking for other organizations similar to mine throughout the country. I, the member directory is a chance for you to go in and do that and find those people and, and find the contact information to kind of create your own networks outside of even what we've provided here uh, through our site. And just quickly, we've got to add that members also have the opportunity to to export a personalized Excel spreadsheet that has um, has, a, has a list of the different um, organizations that, that were stipulated by the filter. So it's a really, you can create sort of a personal outreach um, spreadsheet that, that's really mm -hmm. useful for connecting with other organizations that you might want to learn from or, um, or connect with to, to advance your work. So and that's a member functionality that we found people really, really enjoy that create a contact list. There you go. Yeah, right here. All right, great. So that's the member directory. Let's jump over to our forum now. This is our member forum where members have the opportunity to post specific questions to the rest of our members. Um, you can uh, sign up, members can sign up for the forum to get updates on who's posted questions. We've really found that there are so many specific questions and opportunities and problems that people working in nonprofit arts education run into and the forum is a chance for them for you to ask those specific questions and, and use the expertise of, of all, all our members. You know, everyone here is working in arts education and has a, a very um, distinct uh, expertise on what it takes to run nonprofit arts education organizations. So this is a chance to kind of ask those questions and it can go from anything like this most recent one here is uh, studios, questions about Studio School Pro, which is a registration software mm -hmm. used for arts organizations. Uh, we've got one, I pulled up another one, uh, executive director evaluation tools. Someone had a question looking for examples of specific ED evaluation tools. These are, uh, these are things that can be difficult to find kind of even in the, the general internet, but because we've got a, a tight network of people who know these, who have experience with this, who have very similar uh, job, have run into similar um, uh, problems in their job and issues that they're trying to deal with. Our network of members is sometimes the best group of experts to turn to. Uh, so continuing along that, I believe we've got some more networking opportunities, Drew. Thanks, McAdam. Um, so in my work as community manager, one of my tasks is to um, 
to strengthen our, the ability for our members to connect with one another across the country. Uh, and because we are a national organization, sometimes that can be a, a little difficult, difficult because our membership is spread so widely, but I think that's also what makes it really strong. Um, so one of the ways that we've tried to uh, connect our members in new ways is through our ambassador program, um, which essentially is 18 uh, strategically placed ambassadors around the country who act as our conduits um, for our membership. Um, so we recognize that we can't be everywhere. Uh, we are based in New York. As you heard, there are sirens behind McAdams, so it's pretty clear that we're in New York City. Um, but we are, we are, you know, we're a small but mighty staff, and we recognize that we have a lot of members that we want to serve, we want to connect. So um, we decided to use the ambassador program as a way to uh, bring together these this fantastic cohort of ambassadors who are leaders in the field of arts education in different areas of the country. Um, and essentially they are tasked with uh, being points of contact to our members, answering questions, um, helping them with any issues they might have, but also being conveners um, either in their various regions. So New York, for example, for Travis Laughlin, or they're conveners around a particular topic interest. Um, so we currently have five national networks, which I'll discuss in more, more in depth in a moment. Um, and Nancy Cleaver, for example, is an ambassador for one of our uh, national networks that's uh, based around arts and education. Um, so we have national networks for different topic interests, and we have ambassadors that lead those networks and facilitate conversations that are often members only around a specific um, topic. So members self-affiliate with these national networks, and then they are invited to members only events where they can talk about issues specific to arts and education with organizations all around the country, which is a really unique formulation that we found can be extremely powerful because uh, you might know all the people that are in your area, but people that are doing work around with public schools in Chicago might, might be able to, um, to, to teach you something a little bit different. Uh, so now moving on to our specific networks. As I mentioned, we currently have five that are listed here, uh, but at the end of summer, we are really excited to launch three more, and I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. But currently, our active networks are the Alana Network, the Arts and Education Network, the Collegiate Divisional Network, uh, the Creative Youth Development Network, and the Small Schools Network. And I'll just say a little bit um, more about each. Uh, so our alumni network is um, rose out of the, really the recognition that um, there needs to be a specific, there needs to be specific um, institutions and systems in place to support leaders of color in the arts. Uh, so uh, around 2014, some of our members and some of our staff uh, really recognized that this needs to be, there needs to be, um, a formalized way to support this work within arts, edu arts education. And so the Alana Network was born and uh, is now one of our strongest and most successful networks. Um, and then we also have our Arts and Education Network, which is designed to support arts educators that are working in public schools. Um, and for example, the Arts and Education Network um, recently had a, an event earlier this year. It was a Zoom chat, it was for members only. Um, and the program was uh, as you can see at the bottom under, under some of the resources that were produced, it was called Social Justice-Based Curriculum in K-12 Partnerships. And so it really modeled different ways that people are approaching issues of social justice while, work, while partnering with their local public schools. Um, so using the arts, um, it, various disciplines, music, uh, visual yeah. arts, but trying to get at this, these questions of social justice. Um, then we have the Collegiate Divisional Network, which provides support for arts education programs that are division of a college, which they have unique problems and issues as they have parent institutions. So we recognize that they need a specific network to discuss their particular um, difficulties uh, and successes. We also have the Creative Youth Development, Creative Youth Development Network, um, which as James mentioned, supports organizations that provide youth development, but um, use the arts as the main vehicle for doing so. Uh, and then we also have a small schools network, which just got off the ground relatively recently and is designed to support organizations with a budget size below 750,000. Um, and um, yeah, so that's uh, pretty much an overview of the networks. I'm gonna pause for a second. Uh, if anyone has any questions uh, at the moment, um, I know we've covered a lot of ground already. So if anyone does have any questions, I wanna just pause and uh, give, give about 30 seconds for people to to put forward questions. I don't know. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. Okay. Hi, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Deborah. I'm from the Wallace Sandberg Center for the Performing Arts in Beverly Hills. Hello, everyone. Um, I just, you said you're going to go over the, the three additional ones that are being added at the, at the end of summer. Yes. As well later. So we'll hear about those because these are great. I'm just wondering what the others are as well. Sure. Yeah. I was going to mention them. Um, 
you know what, now, now is as good a time as any, I suppose. Uh, so we're, uh, there'll be more info as these start to, um, as they start to roll out, but we are planning to launch the large schools network, which will be a kind of companion to the small schools, which will serve organizations um, with a budget size over 2 million. Um, and then we also plan to launch the Emerging Leaders Network, which is uh, which has been kind of piloted at the conference last year and some, with some other Zoom chats. Um, and the idea of that is really to support um, leaders who either are new to the field or who are a little on the younger side, who see themselves as emerging leaders, who maybe are in a, a middle management position or maybe are planning to move into uh, more of a leadership role as an organization and really want that support system to know what are the skills I need? How do I develop as a leader? How do I network? Um, and it's really self-affiliated. People who see themselves as an emerging leader will be welcome in the network. Uh, and then the final one is the White Allies Network, which is, will be a companion to the Alana Network. Um, so the Alana Network to support leaders of color, but we also recognize that there are arts educators around the country um, that are white that want to be a part of the racial justice work. So that network will be designed to um, to to work alongside the Alana Network to support to promote social and racial justice. So a uh, question, like the small schools and large schools. So I'm reading here, so the schools, you're, they're actually arts organization programs. So when you're saying school, it's not an actual school or- No, like sorry, we, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, yeah. we're over 750,000. So I'm assuming that we would yeah. be a large school network. Yeah, so it, it's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, small organizations network sounded a bit clunky, so uh, right. or small programs network sounded it. So uh, it is really just based on budget size. Okay. Um, even if you are a division of a larger organization, or if you are a program within a larger performing arts center, for example. Um, and so it's it's there. We we try to design the programming so that it speaks to the issues just of budget size, not necessarily of being an independent school. Um, mm -hmm. So there might not always be crossover, but we but we try to um, bring as many people into the conversation as possible. And it's a little, it's not, those aren't hard and fast guidelines either because, yeah. you know, depending on where you are in the country, 750 could be a nice sized budget for an organization or it could be a small sized. So right. it's a little right. bit where you are comfortable and where your organizational structure fits in too. Yeah. Got it. That makes sense. Because I was like, school, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Right. I was yeah. a little confused because then it was, okay, got it. Yeah. We went You're with alliteration. Like small so. schools, like a small school. Right, right. Or high school. Got it. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Deborah. Is there anything else before I move on? Uh, no, am I the only one? I'm the only one listening to all of you guys. I have like a private, <laughs> private conference going on. <laughs> no, I'm good, thank you. Okay, great, thanks so much. All right, let's keep it moving. James, I'm gonna throw it over to James. We're gonna talk a little bit about our online learning series. Great, thank you so much. So the online learning series, uh, that we put together for 2017 really complements a lot of the work that the Ambassador Network is doing, builds on some of the leadership work that's happening, as well as leverages uh, some of the conference material that's generated throughout the year. Um, this is a chance for us to connect our members and those who are affiliated with us to um, online uh, classrooms in which they can really be a part of conversations just like this. You'll have a presenter who will share some content, but then being able to offer that lens through which people can engage in a dialogue. Again, focusing on building that learning community. I uh, just wanted to show you one in particular. Um, can you scroll down a little bit for me, McAdam, to Let's Have Coffee? Uh, it's under the arts management, nonprofit management. Yeah. So this is a really cool one that was actually done by Fiona Chatwin, who was one of our um, network ambassadors. And she was able to work with a fundraiser at her organization in San Diego, California, who said, hey, I would love to offer um, a 90 minute session for National Guild members. So he did a session for National Guild members around the art of face to face fundraising. Um, Fiona was able to facilitate the conversation. It was really just a chance for you have this, this field practitioner in Fiona Chatwin from Villa Musica in San Diego, and then you have a professional fundraiser to engage in a dialogue that also lived in theory, but was also deeply rooted in practice. And Fiona was able to really talk about, hey, you know what, he showed me how to do this. I had coffee, I think Fiona said she had coffee two days ago with a potential um, funder and was able to secure an $8,000 check in that meeting. 
Um, so being able to bring that narrative along with that data and I guess that professional perspective of this person who is a fundraiser um, to our members, that's something that we've really been able to pride ourselves on and leverage throughout the year in bringing these opportunities to people nationwide. Uh, I also think one of the great things about the online learning series is that being that our membership is national, we're not always able to get everybody together uh, in the same place. And so this is just a great way for us to continue to build community virtually, uh, but also give you a high quality professional development experience. And the, you know, the, the thing about this, these video chats have revolutionized everything. Through this, um, Drew is our magician and sort of orchestrating all these, being able to have breakout rooms where we can break you out right now and put you in of two or three so you can have conversations about things that you're looking for in joining a national service organization that's primarily focused on the arts. And then being able to come back all together as this group of, say, 10 or 15 people and have this collective conversation. So using this technology, um, these online classrooms has really revolutionized the way that we're able to offer programming uh, on a continual basis throughout the year. Hey, James and Drew, um, sorry, uh, Adrian Jefferson, uh, she's having trouble with her audio, but she actually had a question too. Um, so I thought I'd bring it up um, of course. to everyone. She, it looks like she works at the uh, Connecticut Office of uh, Office for the Arts and was asking, do we, uh, work with state arts agencies and what the nature of our relationship with state arts agencies is. Absolutely. We do a lot of work with um, states arts agencies um, and the nature of our work with them. Uh, of course, we provide professional development experiences and opportunities for the staff there, but really connecting to those that they're working directly with. Uh, we have a really great um, really great partnership with the Cleveland Foundation and the Pennsylvania Council mm -hmm. for the Arts, one of our most recent ones, in which they're able to provide services to their grantees directly through us. They can tell us what they want, uh, and we're able to program and connect with people on a national scale to bring to Philly or to Pennsylvania and work directly uh, with those organizations that they serve, which are about 40 or 50 um, through this particular grant program. But we're always doing work with um, state arts agencies. We're looking at doing something um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and working really, really centrally with that group of people. And over the years that these partnerships have evolved, um, we're starting to sort of <laughs> rethink our model. Hey, this is the way that we should probably start working um, as well, being able to offer that in-person program. If we're working with a state arts agency, we can get on the ground there. We can find out exactly what your constituents need and program accordingly. Uh, I think one of the benefits of being connected to a <laughs> national organization is that you have, um, you have resources that you can pull from all over the world. Uh, and we're able to get in contact with these people and bring them to your neck of the woods. Uh, excellent question. Thank you so much. I hope I answered it for you. Yes, Adrian says, thank you. This sounds terrific. All right, Adrian. Thank you for asking that, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, we've done a lot of very specific um, programming, working with Pennsylvania Council for the Arts, as James said, and Cleveland Foundation, uh, to create programming specifically tailored for uh, their organizations that they're working with. So, great question. Uh, let's jump forward. Now we, I've lost my place. Let's, where are we now? Let's jump forward uh, to publications. Yeah. So one of the great things about the publications is that sometimes these work in tandem with programs. Um, and so when we talk about the powerful partnerships with K through 12 schools, we had a program um, that has since sunsetted, but really worked to sort of um, bring that learning back and sort of zoom out and say, okay, what do we learn from working with this program K through 12 schools? So we were in turn able to put forth a publication to keep that learning going and to serve as a resource for those who are interested in looking at how do I work with um, K through 12 schools. Um, there's a bunch of reports that live in this uh, feature publications place. We did an arts infusion program in which we worked with um, the city of Chicago and looking at uh, youth incarceration and what types of arts ed programs are in place to really think about sort of that youth justice space and get young people before they get into the system or system uh, becoming system affiliated. Uh, one report I want to draw your attention to that's fairly new, well, it's not even fairly new, it is new, um, is our 2017 benchmarking data report in which McAdam worked really hard to work with a lot of our member organizations in getting that data together. 
McAdam, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, the benchmarking data report was, uh, it all told, it really took us about um, eight months of uh, surveying our member organizations about the kind of financial data, um, staff salaries, uh, financial aid, um, finances, faculty numbers, kind of gathering all this information so that we can benchmark how the field across the country is doing. And we partnered with Data Arts on the report this year. It's the first time we've partnered with them on the report. And with them, we've been able to uh, kind of use, I don't know if some of you might be familiar with Data, data Arts uh, and had to have gone through their uh, fiscal year surveys before, but they collect so much information that we were able to use a lot of that data as well to really help filter and break down the data sets so that we have very specific uh, numbers that we're able to use and share with our members through this report um, and uh, through their functionality as well, able to kind of put everything into these, uh, what we think are some very nice and easy to read graphs and tables uh, that make the report a lot more accessible. Um, than just kind of throwing tables of numbers at you. Um, and as well, uh, as, uh, as well as that, Data Arts has been, and they're still in the process of kind of building out uh, online functionality so that you would be able to go through uh, their system and uh, really kind of tailor your search results to get the specific data that you're looking for. If there's something that's not quite uh, in the report, the summary report as it is, you can talk to them about how to get that specific data that you're looking for. So uh, we're excited about it. We're excited after eight months or so of working on it that we're not working on it anymore. But uh, there's a lot of great information in there. And uh, the we do this every two or three years. We put together a, a new benchmarking report. And the report is always free for members who fill out the survey. Uh, they're included within the data sets. Uh, and uh, members who want to purchase the survey uh, get it at a discount. Um, $100 for members, $175 for non-members. Uh, just to jump back to the publications really quickly, for the most part, most of our publications are free for members, free uh, digital downloads. We do, um, there is a fee if you want a printed version of it, but they're free digital downloads for almost all of our publications. Uh, the benchmarking report, because of the work that has to go into it, um, and because we have to partner with Data Arts on it, uh, this is one of the few that we actually do uh, require a fee to, to purchase. Though it is free for everyone who fills out the report, for members who fill out the report. Uh, next, let's just hop over quickly to the Resource Center. Um, so our members also, one other thing they get is access to our Resource Center, which is a place where we have gathered a lot of online data uh, re, uh, reports and um, pages, a lot of it evaluated and um, curated by people from the field uh, that has gathered information really helpful to running a nonprofit arts organization. Um, so as you can see right here in our current resource center, again, we're working on a new website. So this will uh, be slightly different in, uh, by the end of the year, but uh, it will still be broken out in these in categories so that's a little easier to find what you're looking for. So for example, we've got fundamentals, governance and leadership, fundraising, marketing and communications. There is also a kind of general search feature that you have, but you can also, if you do, are just browsing, looking for something in particular, you can kind of click on governance and, res uh, governance and leadership. You see you get an introduction and the tools and within each section, Everything is kind of further broken down into specific articles, uh, resources that we've pulled together. A lot of it from our own archive, Guild Notes, uh, Drew will talk about in a minute, is our own kind of archive of news on the field. We turn to our members frequently to um, create, in, uh, create news and articles and resources for us. Uh, but some of it as well, just kind of curated from partners, uh, and important reports that really reflect the needs of our nonprofit arts education members. Um, on top of that as well, something that uh, we've, our members have found really helpful are these templates and sample documents, which uh, kind of give you guys a chance, give our members a chance to look at how some of other members have put together um, some kind of standard forms, everything from you know a list of board member responsibilities, uh, 
board policy bylaws, you can see, you get to see what some of our other members have done. It's uh, helpful if you're working on these often to see how other members have kind of used some of these documents, put them together. And uh, our members are very happy usually to share this information and because, uh, what is it, a rising tide floats all boats, is that it? I'm, I'm bad at the metaphor there. But the idea that helping the field helps everybody that uh, we are kind of all working together because we are all advocates for the importance of arts education in society. Uh, so speaking of Guild Notes, Drew, you want to talk about that? Sure. So um, one of the member benefits that really uh, tends to get highly rated and is really valued um, by our constituents is Guild Notes, which is our quarterly publication. Um, and uh, our latest edition was just released. Uh, so the idea of Guild Notes is that it's uh, tailored articles, resources, tools, uh, specifically for the arts education community, and it's just released um, to our members. Uh, so as McAdam and James mentioned, we just released our benchmarking report. So as a companion piece to that, we, you can see at the top there, we did an uh, article called Using Benchmarking to Strengthen Your Organization. Uh, and this was really designed to say, we have this benchmarking report, but now, you know, what do you do with it and how do you use it to really drive your organization forward? Um, so in that, we shared some general best practices, but we also shared a case study of Settlement Music School um, in Philadelphia, which used benchmarking and another number of other techniques to um, really jumpstart their, their strategic planning and their capitalization plan. And they've been incredibly successful um, in that regard. So this article points to that. And then it also uh, points readers towards a recent webinar that we did with Settlement, um, where they went really in depth into their capitalization plan. Um, and that webinar was for our members. Uh, so Guild Notes is a way to uh, kind of tie things together between our, our, some of our broader programming um, and, uh, and some of the content that we, that we put in Guild Notes itself. Um, so we have some recurring um, features in Guild Notes, such as Leadership Insight, uh, which is really some of the best uh, leadership practices um, that are going on in the field at the moment. Uh, we'll bring in people to interview that are, that are really fantastic leaders in the field. We have a forum where we draw on the knowledge of our members to talk about a specific issue. Um, and we'll go into three or four case studies um, of our members and what they're doing around topics related to uh, parent engagement, um, and various other things along those lines. Um, and then we have a critical perspectives feature, which um, just provides some um, some in-depth, an in-depth look at a, at a topic that's really important and uh, vibrant in arts education at the moment. Uh, and Guild Notes is, uh, I think, a great way to stay up to date of what's going on. And it's also an incredible archive of, of knowledge of the field. Um, and people, I always hear that people will come, come to these back issues and um, sort of reorient themselves with things that were discussed at, um, within, within another issue. All right, great. So now I'm going to pass it off to James, who can talk about some of our signature programs. Absolutely. Thanks, Drew. Um, so just want to talk a little bit about our Community Arts Education Leadership Institute and the Conference for Community Arts Education. So Kaylee, as it has come to be called, uh, the Community Arts Education Leadership Institute is in its eighth year. And what this is, is really an introspective look at who you are as a leader. Um, some people think leadership institutes are about management training, arts management training. This is not. Um, it's a chance for you to really engage with about 26 leaders from around the country, from arts organizations, to address core values, um, to learn more about effective and efficient communication. Uh, there's a personality assessment that takes place. Um, all types of things. We've also built in a newer component to the program that looks at sort of uh, bias and privilege as they pertain to from positions of leadership uh, in your organization and in the community. But it's a competitive application process. Uh, usually we open the applications in, I'd say, early February. Um, and so we already accepted our class for 2017, and we're actually going to be meeting uh, for two weeks, for a week, in two weeks at Bryn Mawr University out of Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Um, it's about an eight-month-long program. We have that one-week intensive out at Bryn Mawr, and then we follow it up with peer-to-peer -peer coaching as well as individual one-on-one -on -one executive coaching with an executive coach, uh, Mary Parrish, who was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we work with an all-star faculty to put together this program. 
uh, partners in performance. They are the ones who are sort of the chief designers uh, of the program, and John McCann is the, the lead director. But it has become by far one of our most sought after offerings. Um, it's open to all, not just members, but members do receive um, I say preferable consideration when applying because they are guild members, as well as a deeply discounted uh, member rate for registration fees for the actual institute. Uh, we, we offer financial aid for the program and through our alumni network, uh, which we've recently started doing, uh, we have 176 Institute alumni. Uh, we've been able to offer some video chats, very similar to what you're doing right now, but also some regional alumni programming. So we're going to have an alumni Institute on July 23rd, 24th, excuse me, out at Bryn Mawr, which we're really focusing on bringing some folks from the East Coast that are alum uh, out to the program. And then we're also going to be doing an alumni retreat uh, with John McCann, who's an institute designer, and Ronnie Brooks, who is our sort of values instructor um, at the at the uh, National Conference for Community Arts Education. Uh, that's a perfect segue in, into this next part, actually. Um, so our flagship program, the largest program that the National Bureau produces, is the Conference for Community Arts Education. This is an annual conference. Uh, we are now in the 80th year of doing this, and we will be in San Francisco and Oakland, so sort of the Bay Area, November 15th through the 18th. Uh, the conference is roughly about three days. Our first day is pre-conferences, um, in which those are really deep dives into specific topics. This year, we're going to be doing one around working with young people in communities who are victims of trauma. Uh, we have one um, that's going to be talking about organizational capacity and sustainability. Um, we have our leadership one that I just alluded to, the Cayley Alumni Institute. Uh, we're also going to be doing one around racial justice and sort of how do you bring um, this lens of social justice to your organization. And then we're going to be doing um, a few other things along the conference track that really, uh, really talk about how you move your organization into the place you want it to be. Our conference is broken up in tracks. So we have a leadership development track, a social justice track, um, an arts management track. Uh, I'm forgetting something. Drew and McAdam, please jump in. Um, the Drew and McAdam are, are work with us in programming the conference, but it's just, it's a really great three, four days of, of coming together as a community of arts educators and talking about issues uh, that, that you have self-designated um, and, and want to talk about. 80% of the conference program comes from uh, when we do the open call for session proposals. Uh, they come from you all. So these are things that you want to talk about that you deem important and necessary to bring to the forefront and, and have that stage to really, hey, I want to help solve this or I want to teach somebody what I learned in doing this. Um, it has by far become one of the most sought after, if not the most sought after offering that the Guild provides. And it's just a great way for us to continue to build community to sort of further engage and enforce that learning community and get a chance to get together and talk about most effective practices on how we can move our communities forward. One of the other great things about conference, I'll just add this and then turn it over to, to my brothers in programming um, to, to say more about it. But on Saturday, we're able to really get out into the community and do site visits and see what organizations are doing in the Bay Area. Uh, last year, we were in Chicago and it, it's it's just when I, we were actually there when the Cubs won, so it was a little crazy. <laughs> but um, parade came was, right past the hotel. <laughs> sure <it> did. <laughs> but um, but nonetheless, it's just a great way for us to see the community, to learn more about the community, and to see the young people in that community, the seniors in that community, what people are doing uh, with their programming. Uh, these have turned into not just site visits, but off-site sessions, and um, I, I think have become one of again, the most sought after offerings during the conference program. Yeah, just to jump on what James is saying too, uh, part of what we really love about the conference is that it's not just, we really do try to connect it to the community in which the conference is being held, but it's not tailored just for that community, but more about looking at what's going on in that community and how that can be expanded to arts education nationally as well. Uh, and to we also before um, when we're first before we launch uh, open up the window for submitting proposals or open up application or 
open up um, registration, we go into that community and hold a couple kind of town hall style meetings as well. So I just wanted to point it out right here on our main conference page. We've got the notes from the meetings that we held in the Bay Area and in Pasadena, um, which was talking to people working in arts education in those communities about what was going on, what were the needs of their communities, what was going really well, what were things, what were the kind of professional development that they would like to see, um, that site visits that they think would be really interesting. Uh, and so we share these with everyone, uh, anyone interested at conference, but we also turn to them a lot as we're programming to make sure that we are really being um, respectful and reactive to what's going on in those communities. Yeah, and just, just add a couple things. Um, you know, I think something that really excites us when we hear it, and we hear it all the time, is that people say when they come to the conference, um, there's a sense that they've kind of found their home a little bit. You know, sometimes in arts education, it kind of stra it's not quite not quite just arts, not quite just education, so it straddles a lot of different worlds. Um, and I think people can really find themselves in the people that they meet at the conference. Um, and uh, I would also say, you know, it is a commitment, especially if you have to travel. So um, if you're interested in coming to the conference, uh, you, you can see there's a few testimonials there, but I think a really great way to figure out why it might be valuable or why you might be, need to put in the time or the commitment is to connect with others who have done it. Um, so please reach out to us and uh, we have, can try and connect to you with an organization that's similar to yours to, to really think about what the, um, uh, what the return might be for, for you and for your organization. And we'd be happy to do that. Well, one other thing we try to help with as well is we do offer 50% off a conference registration to new members. That's right. part of how we, that's part of how our, our dedication and our belief that the conference is a good, uh, is such a good program. We, sp we do spend a lot of our, of our year, honestly, putting together the programming for the conference. And um, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to, to be able to come. So as part of uh, our, what we offer new guild members is 25% off dues for their first year, but also that 50% off of conference registration. Uh, registration will be opening this month also. So just a, a heads up on that as well. Great. So I think that that's, we're going to stop talking at everyone. Um, and uh, we have about 13 minutes. And uh, so I just kind of want to open it up if people have questions about anything that we've talked about, if you have specific questions about, you know, need, these are the needs at my organization, and I wonder how they might be met by the Guild. Um, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and speak up. You can also uh, use the chat function on the right if that's more comfortable for you. Um, so yeah, this is really, I uh, just want to open it up to the group. Wow, we've given such comprehensive information. There's <laughs> Job well done, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Right, great, so we'll take about 15, 20 more seconds if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, it never hurts to, uh, to leave early. Yeah. As you can tell, we like to talk, so we're happy to answer <laughs> any question. S. Turner has a hand raised. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? I don't know if you can hear or see me. Mm -hmm. Can you? We can hear you. We can hear you. Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm just curious um, about when I see uh, organizations that host leadership institutes and <clears throat> leadership events, I always think that that's for more of a, a younger administrator, but who are, who's your key people that attend these kinds of events? I'm just curious. Great question. So, so Kaylee in particular, the um, Community Arts Education Leadership Institute, we get a little bit of everybody who attends those, uh, who attends that particular program. Uh, we have some people who are well steeped in their career, who might be toward the end of their community arts ed career and thinking about what's next. And then we may have some folks who are sort of fairly new to their leadership position at the organization. And it really doesn't have anything to do with sort of where you are in your leadership journey as much as sort of this, this appointed title of what you're thinking about doing and being able to articulate why you want to be a part of the Institute um, mm -hmm. has become very important. The class is curated and chosen by 
those who have graduated from the program. So Institute alum put together the, the class. We have very little to do with it. And so they really look at readiness, right? So we'll have some people who are executive directors or founders of organizations. But we'll also have program directors and program managers who are um, in their organizations. And we found that having that diversity of applicant and that diversity of participant, especially where they are in their career and age, really rakes for a much richer experience. As well as uh, size of organization that they come from. Too. Absolutely. All right. Is it competitive? It is competitive. There are 26 slots with which we um, have applicants apply for, and we usually get about 70 applicants per year. So we're able to, to sort of take one in three applicants, which isn't bad, um, but, but nonetheless, we, we do have some people who are repeat applicants, and that's also taken into consideration uh, when reviewing the applicant materials. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I had a question, Deborah, again, about um, yep. the conference, you, the specific tracks. If you come to the conference, can you go, can you switch amongst the tracks, or do you have mm -hmm. to track and follow that whole track? To the conference? Nope, you can switch all around as much as you want. We just sort of identify by track, just in case you do want to follow that learning arc, um, because we do try to tailor it so that people who are part of that track will start somewhere and then uh, and then finish in a place that, that makes sense along the arc but you can have people jump around because the tracks inevitably are gonna uh, have crossover so um so yeah absolutely it's up to you whichever sessions you want to choose perfect thank you we have a sorry we have a question from the chat from uh chris uh, what resources could the Guild offer for a small arts education center's move toward a class schedule that includes a bigger emphasis on the arts and healing, mm. the arts and wellness, and a list of arts and specific mental and physical issues? James, do you want to speak to this a bit? Absolutely. So, so great question, Chris. I love it. Um, actually, during this year's conference, we're going to be doing an extended session that talks about arts and healing. And arts and healing, um, as they pertain to working with communities, uh, that have fallen victim to trauma or, or participants that are victims of trauma. Uh, and then we'll also be doing a few sessions throughout this year's program that talks about or that works around providing services to, to um, populations with special needs. Um, so there's quite a bit of programming coming up for the conference, at least, uh, for, um, for special populations. Um, in terms of the 2017 online learning series, uh, we have not programmed um, anything that works with special needs populations, but looking at the 2018 year, um, these will definitely be, um, be one of the themes. Uh, there's been a lot of requests on how to effectively work with uh, young people with autism. Uh, unfortunately, that is um, on the rise, but, um, but that's, a, that's a, an amazing question. Thank you, Chris. Um, that arts and healing and arts and wellness conversation as you work with the community you serve and then also those that provide the services, uh, they need some healing and wellness work as well um, because it is, it is absolutely exhausting taking on all that energy and not necessarily having a social worker on staff or an outlet to help you process that um, has turned out to be uh, one of the key concerns for our constituents in the field as well. So thank you so much for that, Chris. And Chris, I'd also add that I think a resource we can provide is some of our programming at the conference for sure, and some of the program we'll provide online, but also just, um, you know, I think all of us on staff have five or 10, you know, off the top of our heads of organizations that are, have been in that position recently where they were slightly smaller um, community organization that has expanded to in, start to incorporate these issues of arts and healing and um, thinking about wellness more broadly, just beyond artistic discipline. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, just, just being able to reach out to us and, you know, us being able to point you in the direction of five you know, organizations that could really talk to you about that transition, I think is a valuable resource as well. Um, so. Hope that answers your question. Chris gave out a thanks through the chat. Great. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, great. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, it's really exciting to talk about our work. Uh, sometimes we kind of 
are here in our little office in New York. And so it's amazing to see people that are across the country that's doing this work and us talking about how we might be able to support you. Um, so thanks so much to my colleagues, James and Mac Adam. Uh, and as we, as we all said, you please feel free to reach out to us after this if you have more specific questions. Uh, if you want to learn more about membership, learn more about the conference, about Kaylee, um, please let us know. We're happy to answer any questions. And um, we hope to see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so, so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.